Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, let's get started. My name is Stefan T. Lawade, and I am uh, one of the developers on Microsoft's CS Plus Standard Libraries team. Uh, so since 2007, I've been working on MSVC's STL, uh, implementing features as they've been standardized from CS Plus 11 through CS Plus 17. Um, I just finished working on one feature that I want to talk to you today about, um, CareCon. Uh, and I've referred to it as CS Plus 17's final boss. So today I'm going to explore um, what does CareCon do, um, how to think about floating point, um, because this was a learning experience for me as I went through uh, implementing it, um, how to use CareConf uh, to generate nicer looking output faster than anyone ever believed was possible, um, and finally, why it's so fast, what techniques uh, enabled this. Um, so as we get started, um, you will probably have questions because floating point is complicated. As the abstract said, floating point is ancient, mysterious, and terrifying. Um, when you have questions, please use your pocket supercomputer to write down the slide number and maybe take a photo of the slide. We can come back to it later at the end of the presentation. Uh, by the way, if you haven't heard, on Monday we announced that our STL implementation is now open source. It's on GitHub under the Apache 2.0 with LVM exception license. You can go there right now and look at our source code, including all the source code for the feature I'm talking about. Um, we are accepting issues and we'll accept pull requests very soon once we get tests and CI online. Um, another um, bit about the ground rule assumptions during this talk, uh, I'm going to assume that float is 32-bit IEEE, double is 64-bit IEEE, um, and I am not going to talk about long double in this talk, uh, mostly because on MSVC's uh, platform, long double is the same representation as double, uh, which is awesome uh, for an implementer because that meant that we only had to do a 32-bit and a 64-bit implementation. Um, all, the technique, all the techniques described here for CareConf um, should generalize to 80-bit, 128-bit implementations elsewhere um, with more work. Uh, okay, so let's go back and think about why is it called floating point? Uh, you know, we've all used double and float as programmers, um, but why would we ever want to use floating point? Are there any alternatives? Um, so there's this notion of fixed point, which is actually simpler, although we don't have a fixed point type in the standard library right now. There might be one in the future. Imagine that you just want to store decimal numbers, no binary yet, um, and you want to store fractional numbers. So if you're doing that, you could say, okay, I'm going to spend um, five digits, and I'm just going to store that as an integer, and I'm going to store hundredths. So if I want to store one one hundredth, I can just store the integer one. Um, that gives you a fairly wide range. Um, here I've shown the extremes of range that you can store and very predictable precision. But what if you need more range? Then you could say, oh, okay, I remember scientific notation from school. Um, maybe I could spend like four digits on um, the actual you know, number itself and then maybe one digit on the exponent to multiply. And if you do this, you find that you gain a whole lot more range. You can store very tiny numbers because it comes from the exponent and very large numbers. Uh, and you don't give up too much precision, uh, but the precision becomes sort of variable. When you have very tiny numbers, you have lots of precision, and when you have very large numbers, um, you sort of lose precision. It's kind of variable. Um, so that's interesting, but the increase in range is often worth it. So now let's switch to the floating point that computers actually use. Now humans love decimal because we have 10 fingers, we count with that. Um, computers, though, they love binary. So if we want to store numbers in a way that can be processed by a computer quickly, we would want to store an integer times some power of two. Here I've got an example, uh, 3.875. That number can be exactly represented um, as both decimal, you know, 3,875 times 10 to the negative three, or as binary. That's just 31 times two to the negative three, or 31 over eight. Um, so these are exactly representable, and I could just store the integers 31 and three appropriately uh, encoded um, to represent this number in a computer. Um, so we also use binary for integers. It's pretty simple. We don't have you know, the mathematical ideal of an integer. We can't store infinitely large integers. The range cutoff is kind of weird if you're not used to binary, but we all get used to it very quickly. Once we start using it for fractions, it gets a little more surprising because math. Um, the mathematical consequences of representing a number as an integer times a power of two. So let's think about bases for a moment. Uh, think about base seven, which I've chosen as an artificial base. Nobody actually uses it. Um, if you think about the exact real number, one over seven, it's you know, a rational number, you can write that in base seven with a terminating expansion. This is just 0 0.1 if your digit is one in base seven. Uh, but if you try to write that thing in base 10, you get an infinitely repeating decimal. Um, now, does that mean that base 10 is bad? No. 
one over seven is infinitely precise. It just can't be written in, you know, a finite decimal expansion in base 10. It's just because seven and 10 have pri different prime factors. 10's prime factorization is two times five. Neither of those are seven. So when you deal with mixing binary and decimal, um, it's not quite the same as base seven and 10 because binary is base two, decimal is two times five. So you get this one-way compatibility. Every binary fraction, some number times a power of two, maybe negative, um, can be exactly written down in decimal. You write enough digits, eventually it's gonna stop. But if you do the reverse, if you take some decimal fraction, like 0.3, you can't necessarily represent that exactly in binary. You might get an infinitely repeating binary fraction. Now, does that make binary bad or fuzzy or non-deterministic? No, it's just a different base. Um, so if you have a binary value, it's an exact real number. Uh, but what do you do if you want to start with a decimal number? Um, what if you have the decimal number 0 0.1, you know, 1 over 10, and you want to get as close as possible as you can in binary? So if you use a 32-bit float, here I'm assuming, you know, the IEEE, Mantis width, and exponent, uh, we'll see about that later. The closest you can get is that number written up on the screen, and that's an exactly precise real number that can be represented in binary. Um, with double, you can get closer. Look how many more zeros there are before you start seeing non-zero digits. Similarly with one over 100, we can't get exact in binary because it's got that pesky power of five in there, uh, but we can get pretty close. I've included this as an example because it shows that the closest number in binary is not necessarily larger than the one we want here. The closest float is 0 0.0099999 bunch of nines before we get non-zero digits. Those digits are not garbage digits. They're just part of the value of the exact real number represented by the binary fraction. Maybe you wanted an exact decimal fraction, but if you're storing that in binary, you're going to get a slightly different value. You just need to learn to understand what's being stored. So what happens when you write 0.1 in your source code? Because you can do that. Well, here's the interesting thing. Just because you can write it exactly in your source code doesn't mean that's what actually, that's what actually gets stored in your program. And this is actually kind of unusual. Usually when we write an integer, we get exactly that value stored, unless the compiler complains, whoa, you know, cast uh, truncates constant value or something. With decimal and double, if you write double y equals 0 0.1, the compiler cannot exactly store 0 0.1 in your double. Instead, what it does is, is if you called the function strt d from the C runtime at compile time, um, it is going to convert the decimal fraction 0 0.1 into the nearest possible double. Um, and this will typically round values in the sense of taking the exactly precise one over 10 and giving you a binary fraction that's very close. Um, the converse, if you take a double um, in binary floating point and emit that as decimal, you know, sequence of characters, that might round if you only want a few digits, or you could get exactly precise if you're willing to emit a, enough digits. That's what this talk is gonna be about. Um, so here I'm trying to get at the point that when you have a floating point value, no matter how you got it, once you get it, it's an exact crystalline real number. There's no fuzziness, there's no non-determinism. You got that real number. Um, the way you got it might have been, you know, a little confusing. Um, floating point math can be notoriously imprecise because functions are not required to give you a mathematically precise result rounded according to IEEE rules because such algorithms could be quite slow. So in practice, you may need epsilon comparisons after performing floating point math. But for the purposes of conversion, I want you to think exact and crystalline. Okay, so I've been sort of dancing around how these things are actually stored. I'm actually not gonna go into depth in that. If you want, read the implementation. Um, the way that floating point numbers are stored according to the IEEE standards is you got a sine bit, you've got an exponent, and you've got a mantissa. The mantissa is the integer morally that is multiplied by two to the power of stuff. There's special encodings for zero, these things called subnormals, infinity and nan. Um, there's a bias to indicate negative numbers. You can all read about it on Wikipedia. Um, for the purposes of CareConf, you can mostly ignore that, um, especially subnormals. Um, some people think, oh, subnormals are weird, or you've heard the term denormal. They might be special to floating point units, but not really for CareConf. They're a minor implementation detail, a little bit of code and from cares, almost none into cares. They're as good as any other um, floating point value. Um, similarly, I'm gonna ignore infinity and nan, um, NAN is weird, infinity is not, and I may have time for floating point, uh, hexadecimal floating point at the end. Okay, so I've been talking about going from decimal to binary and back. Now, if I ask you to convert a binary floating point number to decimal with like two digits after the decimal point, that will not be a round trip conversion in the sense that you're going to lose information. 
Um, but could you do it so that you could keep all of the information and have a successful round trip in the sense you would get literally the same bits at the end? So to think about this, let's look at the printf formats. We've all used printf, we've all used uh, probably a few of these formats, uh, but maybe we're a little rusty on exactly printf syntax and what it does. I certainly had to go read the C standard to get a refresher on this. So whenever I talk about fixed notation, um, it looks like 1729.531250. Um, it's going to emit a fixed number of digits after the decimal point, um, and the precision is configurable, it defaults to six. You can also get scientific notation, in which it will print it out with an exponent, it always looks like, you know, one digit, dot, a whole bunch of decimal digits, exponent, and then plus or minus stuff. Again, the precision is the number of digits after the decimal point. You can ask for this strange thing called general notation, um, which tries to be fixed notation, with a certain number of significant digits, but if the number gets too big or too little, it automatically switches into scientific to represent really small or really large numbers. This is actually pretty common. Um, it's a little strange that this precision is in a different sense. It's the number of significant digits uh, rather than the number of digits after the decimal point, but it turns out to be what people want most of the time. And you can also, since C99 and above and C11 and above, ask for hex floats. A little bit of implementation variance there, interestingly enough. So, you can also specify a specific precision after um, the percent sign. So if you say percent dot two f, that asks for fixed point with two digits after the decimal point. So here I'm showing all of the things the printf would print here. Um, it's going to round my exact value, or exact real value stored as a binary floating point number to the given number of digits. Um, now you could ask for all decimal digits. The way I printed out those floats a few slides back, you know, point one, zero, zero, and then a bunch of digits that are not garbage digits, um, is I use general notation, and I just said percent dot a thousand G, that asks for a whole bunch of digits, and then zero trim them. Um, there's an, uh, you, you can actually calculate an exact bound for double at 767. Um, so that's how you can just get all the digits if you want. Um, so I talked about rounding. What happens when we round? In school, we're often ta uh, taught, if you need to round decimal numbers, um, zero through four rounds down, um, five and above, round up. Um, in the CRT, uh, the C runtime, and the STL, by default, we don't actually do that. We do something a little different called round to nearest, tie break to even. Uh, this is configurable for the CRT. CareConf actually always uses this mode. This is one of the things that makes it fast and simple. Um, and this means that in decimal terms, four and lower always rounds down, six and above always rounds up. If you have five exactly, five zero 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 then you need to look to see whether you need to round to an even digit or not. Um, this is also called um, banker's rounding, banker's division, um, because it avoids introducing bias by always rounding up or down. But if you have like five followed by a million zeros followed by a one, that has got to be rounded up because it's not at the midpoint exactly. That was responsible for a fun bug that we had to fix in the CRT and the STL. So I've got some examples of what rounding would do. There's a UCR2 bug in this area that was recently fixed if you try this with MSVC. Um, but eventually that will go away. Okay, so I've been talking about how to get close to a floating point value. And I gave you the exactly closest number to 0.1 as a float. But what does it look like in the neighborhood? So here I printed out um, the closest value to 0.1, that one's in the middle, followed by the two closest neighbors. You can do this with um, a C99 function called next after, um, or you can do as I did, which is manually adjust the hexadecimal float representation. Um, so you can see here that they're stepping in small-ish increments. For double, they would be very small. Now, if you look at these decimal representations, you'll notice that they all start off the same, you know, either 0.09999 or 0.1000, and then they become different. So these are the numbers at the top half. These are the exact real values. Now, I could start trimming digits away if I wanted to you know, communicate a limited number of decimal digits. Now, I'm certainly getting different real values by trimming away decimal digits, but I'm not losing information until I trim away too many digits. Um, here at the bottom, I've shown how much you can round these values um, while still keeping them distinct to give you some idea of how much of these digits are not necessary. They're not garbage, but they're not necessary to retain all of the information in the, in the original 32-bit float. Um, and you'll notice that the middle one, you can round all the way to 0 0.1 and keep all the information, because that is the nearest one. So, um, if you are starting from a binary floating point number, like a float or double in memory, and you want to convert it to a string of decimal digits, um, like printf, 
Um, and then you want to convert back to binary. Maybe you're serializing to disk and then deserializing back to memory. And if you don't want to alter the stored value, you're interested in doing a round trip conversion. You can recover all the digits, and you don't need to write out all the decimal digits, um, which could be quite long. You can trim them. Um, so if you want to get the absolute shortest number, you need special algorithms. There's a whole history um, which I'm going to get to, um, and it has historically not been available via printout, um, but it is mathematically determined. For a given binary floating point value, it's just a mathematical law given the rounding mode, um, how many digits you can trim to get the shortest representation. There is absolutely nothing non-deterministic about that. Um, it's actually kind of interesting that there's any efficient algorithms to do this. Um, it's actually easier to get just a worst case, like, okay, maybe I can't trim away as many digits as I can, but you could tell me if I only print like nine or 17 digits, I'm guaranteed to preserve all the information. Those are in fact the bounds for float and double. Um, so I've put there the uh, printf uh, format specifiers to exactly capture all of the information in a float or double as decimal. But these are the worst cases. Um, this is also reported by numeric limits, if you've ever wondered the difference between max digits 10 and digits 10. Okay, so what is interesting about shortest round trip uh, actually appeared on an earlier slide. If you start with a human-friendly decimal number, and by human-friendly I mean having a few number of decimal digits, if you then convert that to the nearest possible float, which you can do with things like stir to d careconv, or even just writing it in your source code, you'll get a close binary floating point value. I think of this as quantization, like an analog signal. Um, then if you run one of these algorithms to give you the shortest round trip decimal, you will somehow magically get the number you started with. Why is that? So here, if you're going from binary to the shortest round trip and then back to binary, well, you started with 17.29, so of course that's the shortest round trip representation. It gave you the binary floating point value you started with. Um, so you'll get this human readable number back. And if you tried to use this worst case round trip precision, you would not get that. In this case, um, if you did %.9g with a float, you get 29.0009. This is why floating point values sometimes got a reputation for having garbage digits, but again, no garbage here, it's just math. Okay, and before I get to the rest of CareConf, um, I wanted to point out something, um, especially if you start writing code in your, um, uh, writing things like floating point values in your source code. Um, if you start with a number like pi, and then you convert it to a float. You get this quantization, you get a close binary floating point value. Then if you ask for the shortest round trip, you might think, ooh, this is kind of nice. It gave me a limited number of digits, but that's what I would have gotten if I just took the exact value of pi according to a mathematician and rounded it to that many decimal places. That doesn't always happen. I, here in the bottom, I've shown what happens if you do this with E and a 32-bit float. You get a close float, and then if you get the shortest round trip, you do not get the number that you would have gotten by rounding the exact value of E to that many digits, because you had to go through the float in the first place. If you store a 32-bit float, it has no memory of the real number you wanted in your source code. So don't be surprised if you write the exact value of E up to you know, a million digits, and then you try to print it with shortest round trip, and it messes up a digit. It didn't get messed up. You're just limited by the precision in a float or a double. I'm actually interested if there are any cases where you have an exact real value and then it gives you a float or a double um, that differs in some of the leading digits, but if, it ha if you had started with a different float or double and then did shortest round trip, you would have gotten something that was uh, further away from the real value and yet generated a nicer shortest round trip. Um, if you're interested in looking into that, um, come talk to me later. Um, I would just like it as a counterexample. Okay, so let's look at CareConf. I've been talking about this new thing. What does CareConf do for you? Interestingly, it's just a couple of function overloads um, and return types for them. Um, they're called from cares and to cares. Um, and they work, they're heavily overlo overloaded for both integer and floating point types. Um, so they're very low level. They're unlike printf and stir to d. They don't handle leading white space. They don't have any locales, which as far as I'm concerned is amazing. Um, and they have few options, few configurable options. Um, they're bounds checked, so unlike sprintf, um, they will not overflow buffers. Um, and they also don't use any null termination. When they write, they don't append a null terminator. When they read, they don't need a null terminator. This is actually quite nice if you're working with information that's within like a longer buffer. They don't allocate any memory dynamically, which means they never fail as long as you don't give it something that's out of range or if you don't give it a buffer that's too small. They never throw exceptions. Exception handling is great, but it's just not used in CareConf. 
And as a side effect, and this was not really realized when they were standardized due to the timeline, which I'll be talking about, um, they have amazing performance if the implementation uh, goes to enough lengths. Um, so why is this C++ 20, uh, C++ 17's final boss? Um, when we, the library working group, voted it in, um, we, the implementers, everybody, didn't really think that it was going to be so difficult. We looked at it and we said, okay, it's like three pages of standard ease. We can do this in a few weeks. It looks like things in the CRT. It looks like STD and two-string, which we already have. Yeah, it's a little different. It can't be that hard. It was very difficult to implement. Um, one, one reason why is we couldn't use the usual STL implementer trick. And that trick is, if we can call the CRT to do it, we can just do that. Um, and then provide a wrapper around it. Um, but we can't do that in this case because of null termination, other issues. Um, there's also lots of corner cases when you start trying to write this from scratch. Um, from cares has all, one, all sorts of wonderful corner cases um, that you would never imagine if you just looked at the, the problem definition. Um, and because there are so many different formats, fixed, scientific, general, hex float, precision, shortest, um, then these all multiply out, times float and double and long double if that's different on your platform. Um, so you end up having to do a huge multiple of the amount of work. Um, and it's absolutely not as simple as simply multiplying or dividing by 10. If you see any of that in your source code, it is wrong, I guarantee, very wrong. Um, you need different algorithms. Um, so up here is the timeline of how we shipped this. Um, it took uh, over a year and a half, not of solid work, but of pretty consistent work. Um, and as of VS 2019-16-4, we're shipping the final component, which is uh, general precision. Um, I'll be going over um, all of these uh, floating point functions. Um, I'm gonna leave integer, you can just read the documentation for that, um, that one's actually pretty simple. So CareConf is not only CS Plus 17's final boss, it's also one of the largest things that we have in the entire STL, at least in MSVC's implementation, it is literally the largest component of the CS Plus standard library. Um, it's over half a megabyte of source code, including you know, all the comments in white space. Um, even if you exclude the large static tables, it's still over 200, you know, 20 kilobytes of source code. This puts it on par with the entire execution header for par parallel algorithms. It outclasses the regex header for regular expressions. It is large. Um, and even lookup tables that we happen to compile into your binary, they're like, you know, 120 kilobytes. Um, I chose this tuning uh, because I would rather spend space to gain time. Um, and also the test code involved is enormous. I like to joke that um, CareCom's tests uh, are now actually an outright majority of the size of the uh, RSTL's primary test suite. So it's acquired voting control. It just controls the entire STL. Okay, so I've been talking about these uh, functions. Now I wanna show you fully worked, complete examples of how to use it. Um, I'm only gonna show like, you know, one format and then you can go look up on CPP reference, all the other formats you can do. I'll be describing the various formats. But I wanted to show from beginning to end how to use this. Um, so it's gonna take three slides because I want the code to be readable. Um, you need to include the necessary headers. CareConv provides the machine release. System error provides the error code enum that you're gonna need to look at. And then my test code drags in standard IO and string view, but you don't actually need that to use this function. I have a test function that's gonna take a string view. This is from care, so we're gonna take a sequence of characters, just cares. CareConf does not work with WKRT, no care 16, no 32, just plain old cares. Um, and we're just going to get a first and a last pointer. Here I'm passing string view for my own test convenience, but those care pointer, const care pointers could point into anything, uh, a data structure you already have. And then from cares actually uses an out parameter, which is quite unusual for the STL, but in this case, that's what it does. Um, so you can have a double or a float or a long double um, on the stack, and then you call std from cares and you give it your range of characters with the STL's usual inclusive exclusive convention. You give it a modifiable reference to the float or double that you want it to scribble into, and then it returns a struct called from cares result that contains only two things. It contains one of these std error c error codes, and it contains a pointer to where from cares to stop stopped reading. So the second part of the test program inspects that return value. It may be scribbled something into that double, but first we need to look at the return value. Um, so the returned pointer into the buffer shows you where from care stopped reading. So if it successfully read a float or double, like it saw 17.29 and then the letters meow, it's gonna stop reading at that M and give you a pointer to the M. Or if it read all the way to the end of the buffer, it'll return a pointer to last, the end of the buffer that you gave it. So I can subtract um, the beginning of the buffer and tell you how many characters it successfully read. Then we can look at the error code. This was a very late revision to from cares. Originally was using the full system error 
um, machinery, and then we discovered it had a circularity problem. Um, so it just returns an enum, which is unusual, but it's an integer behind the scenes, so that's good. Um, if it returns a value initialized error C, which here I write as std error C brace brace, um, then that's success. It successfully parsed a floating point value and scribbled it into the, floating, uh, the floater double that you put on the stack. Um, so I can just print it out. Here I'm just gonna print it out with printf because we know that and we haven't covered two cares yet. I'm just gonna use percent %g, which of course does not capture all the information. I just wanna get something close. Um, it can return some error codes. Result out of range says that I overflowed. Um, perhaps I got a really huge value or a really tiny value, maybe I underflowed. Um, there's a library working group issue that covers this if you care about that. If you see invalid argument, that meant that you tried to parse a buffer that just said meow. And that's not a floating point value. There's no meow floats. So you'll get invalid argument, um, couldn't parse anything. And those are the only error Cs that it can return. So my final bit of test code is I'm just gonna um, throw some string literals um, at this, pass them to the string view. If I give it an actual floating point value, like 3.875, success, it's gonna be parsed. I'm gonna consume five characters, including the decimal point, of course. Um, if I give it a huge number, like 10 to the 9999, that is way too big for float or double. Um, so with the resolution of this library working group issue that I want to have happen, um, it's going to scribble infinity and return out of range to let you know that that happened. Um, and if you give it meow, invalid argument. Go away, cats. So that's from cares. Now, you can pass extra enums as, the, as an additional argument to from cares. It defaults to cares format general. This says that I'm going to accept um, strings that either contain fixed point, like 17.29, or scientific with an exponent. It won't accept hex float though, if you know what that is. Um, unlike str to d, you can actually request from cares, hey, I know I'm going to have a fixed point value. Do not even consider an exponent. Um, or conversely, you can say, I'm working with data that I know to be in ex you know, scientific form, so if you don't see an exponent, that's an error. Somehow I've truncated my data or something, so reject that. And you can also parse hex float without an ox prefix. So it's a little bit different interface than str to f and str to d, uh, but not significantly different. Okay, so now the flip side. Um, from cares, we were able to ship by taking our CRT's implementation, uh, dramatically reworking it to adapt to STL conventions, throwing away locales and null terminators and the ability to parse from file stars um, and optimizing and optimizing. Um, and we shipped that um, in a few months. Um, two cares though took a lot longer if you remember the timeline. So what does its usage look like? Does it look scary? No, I can actually fit it into three slides. So let's look at that. So if I want to print something with two cares, first I need to include headers. Again, I need to include care convent system error. Everything else here is for my test code. I want to demonstrate that I can print both floats and doubles. So I'm going to template my test function, but you don't have to template anything. If you just have a float or a double, you can just call two cares. The template here is only for my convenience and test code. Um, so my test is just gonna assert that I'm only being called with floating point values, and I'm gonna detect whether it's actually a float or if it's a double. Again, not necessary if you know what you're working with. I'm just writing a general test case. Um, then we, we're calling two cares, so we need a buffer to scribble into. Now, if you're doing shortest round trip, and if you say like 100, that's fine. Um, 100 is way more than enough than you need to do a round trip for float or double. I would need to do the math for long double. I think it's probably fine. Um, here I've actually written the exact bound, the exact worst cases that you can get for a round trip. It turns out to be 15 characters for 32-bit float, 24 characters for 64-bit double. So if you want a really small buffer, you can do that. Um, so I'm actually using an exactly sized worst case buffer here. And then we call two cares. This actually looks a little bit like from cares. Um, we give it a first and last pointer to the buffer that we want to scribble into. Again, just care, no w care, none of that. And then we give it the floating point value, either float or double, um, that we want to print, and then it returns a struct two cares result, which, surprise, also contains two members, it's an error C and a pointer. Um, the error C is a success code, and if it returns a value initialized error C with, you know, brace brace, then that's successful. It was able to scribble your floating point value into the buffer, shortest round trip form decimal, and the returned pointer in that struct tells you how many characters were written. So here, or one pass, you know, the last character that was written. So here I subtract pointer minus buff that tells me how many characters were written. The static cast is purely for printf's uh, usage, not for um, care comp itself. Of course, that's a putter dictate. Um, otherwise, if I got value too large, that's the error code that says 
you gave me a buffer that was too small. You gave me a buffer of like five characters and I needed to print, you know, one, two, three, four, five, dot six, seven, eight, nine, and that would overflow. So in that case, the content of the buffer is unspecified and it returns an error. And that's the only error code you can get out of er uh, two cares. No other error codes. So if I print a couple floating point values, here I've written um, a float and a double with their exact forms. So yes, they're going through the compiler stir to D, but they're not actually being modified in any way. Um, the shortest round trip form of these, unsurprisingly, if you look at the numbers, is 17.29 for that float value and 1.234 for that double value. Um, so CareConf is doing something very special here. Um, I it chose that 1.234 value to show you that it's not just like chopping things off, it's actually doing rounding. Because it took the exact value 1.233999999 and then a bunch of stuff, and then it noticed, oh, if I had the digits 1.234, if I then ran that through from cares, it would magically get the double that you gave me. So I'm just gonna print out 1.234. And I keep saying magic here for a reason. Um, so all these um, uh, things that we had to implement in two cares are controlled by the same cares format enum that from cares takes. Um, so with from cares, the enum tells you what sort of input to expect. With two cares, the cares format enum tells you what input or what output you want. So if you don't pass anything, you get this sort of novel format. I've taken to calling it plain shortest because I couldn't find a better term for it. I sort of discovered, oh, you know, it's not actually the same as general. Um, what this does is it intelligently, intelligently switches between fixed and scientific notation based purely on the length of the output. And if they would be the same length, it chooses fixed. This, surprisingly enough, is a different criterion than printf uses. Um, and it's actually a nicer criterion, and we're gonna see why. Um, now, if you want a specific format, you can ask for that. If you just pass a cares format enum, you can say, I want the shortest scientific format. That's actually exactly what the Roo algorithm does, we're gonna see that. Or you could say, I want the shortest fixed format. But if you say fixed, be aware that that's not necessarily short. Um, when CareConf talks about shortest round trip, it talks purely about trimming digits after the decimal point. So if you have a very large integer, which floats and doubles can totally represent, like two to the 100 for a double, um, its shortest round trip value is that whole integer, which is a bunch of decimal digits. Um, so be aware of that. You can't get away with a 24 character buffer if you're gonna try to shortest round trip a double with fixed format. Um, and then if you pass cares format general, you will get the printf criterion of switching between fixed and scientific. You can also print a hex float if you want. Shortest round trip just means zero trimming um, there. And then finally, if you want printf-like behavior, you can pass a cares format enum and a precision, and this does exactly what printf would do, except faster, and no null terminator, and no ox prefix for a hex float. Um, so, so much functionality packed into this one function. Now, I had talked about plain format versus general. How do they switch? So here, I've prepared the output of two cares in either plain shortest round trip or general um, shortest round trip um, for a bunch of values that differ only in their exponent. The stuff on the left column is just the number 3.14 times some, some power of 10. Um, and the stuff in the right column is just the number seven times some power of 10. They're different because seven has no you know, trailing digits. So here, look at the shape of the output. If you use the plain shortest round trip, you'll notice that as we need to emit more and more digits, it goes, you know, um, let, let's look at the, uh, the fractional bit. It goes from like 0 .00314, 0 .00314, and then if it became even smaller, it turns out that you could actually get shorter output by writing it in scientific notation. So at, that's the point where plain format switches over to scientific and emits the same number of characters and it writes 3.14 E negative 05. And then if you gave it even smaller values, it would do E negative 06 and so forth. Similarly, as numbers get larger, if it would print too many trailing zeros for that integer, it will switch over to scientific as soon as it could save characters by doing so. So it produces this very nice shape. You could imagine a UI field that would expand and contract based on the number of digits um, that need to be printed, and then it would clamp to a certain width once it started emitting scientific, either for huge or small values. General format does not do this due to the rules of printf. Um, it can either switch to scientific too early or too late. I've highlighted, highlighted those in red here. So plain shortest is actually kind of cool. Um, I think it's more human readable in some sense. But if you need exact compatibility with printf, then you can have it.
Okay, so how does CareConv achieve all of this magic? Um, for FromCare, as I said, that we just use what the, uh, our universal CRT does, which is a big NumPy algorithm. For two cares, though, there's a long history of algorithms to find the shortest round trip decimal notation. This goes back to an algorithm that apparently was floating around for quite some time in unpublished form, and then was published in 1990 called Dragon 4. Um, I can guarantee that everybody has used Dragon 4 indirectly because it is the classic algorithm. Um, most printfs are based on this, or were at some point. Um, it's slow because it uses arbitrary precision numbers, but it's complete. It can handle all possible inputs. And it was improved over the years, but it's still pretty slow. Um, newer algorithms came out in 2010 and 2016 that had various issues. Um, either they were incomplete, meaning they handled like 99.5% of values correctly, and then they detected that they needed a fallback algorithm like Dragon 4, um, or um, they were not quite as fast as the alternatives. Um, then, something amazing happened, and this was actually about two years after CareConv standardization. CareConv was voted into the standard in 2016. This algorithm came out in 2018. Um, there's an engineer at Google named Ulf Adams. Um, he actually works on Google's build system, uh, Bazel. Um, and apparently, as a hobby project, he single-handedly revolutionizes floating point printing algorithms. Um, it's absolutely, he's an impossible wizard, absolutely unbelievable. Um, and he published this algorithm that he called Roo. Um, and it supersedes everything else for printing. It is the fastest known algorithm, and it is complete. It handles everything. So as a standard library implementer, I was overjoyed when I realized this, because all the alternatives either needed an infinite precision, you know, arbitrary precision integer, which we don't have in our standard library, um, and you know, we couldn't uh, you know, easily create one, um, or they needed you know, something um, that was not quite as fast as the alternatives. And I wanted you know, both speed and ease of implementation. Um, Roo turns out to achieve everything. Um, so what techniques power Roo? Now, this is interesting because I worked with it for about a year. I still do not understand the core magic behind Roo to a level that I could write the algorithm from scratch. I believe I understand it enough to modify the code that it uses without damaging it. Um, and I uh, committed a bunch of um, optimizations um, that Ulf Adams accepted um, upstream um, and uh, a few bug fixes, things like that. Um, but the actual magic behind the algorithm, I've read his paper, I've watched his talk, and I still have not quite internalized it, I hope to in the future. Um, so until then, um, please read his paper and his code, it's on GitHub, um, and watch his talk. There's a link um, in the uh, end of this slide. Um, but I can tell you at a high level um, what Roo is doing. Um, it's doing a conversion between binary and decimal. And decimal is, you know, the number 10 is two times five. So you end up, if you do the math, with a bunch of powers of two and powers of five. Um, and uh, Ulf Adams proved that you don't actually need to do this with infinite arbitrary precision. You can actually just use a wide-ish multiplication, like a 64-bit times a 128-bit number, and then shift it to the right a bunch, and essentially lose the lower bits, and it actually doesn't change the correctness. He has a very neat explanation of this. Um, so he generates a bunch of constants that are stored in large constant tables. Um, in MSVC, they're just inline const expert tables, no initialization at all. Um, and then we just do wide multiplications using various intrinsics. Um, after this, in some loops to trim digits, um, and I'm massively you know, simplifying his amazing algorithm here, um, you end up with an integer. So if you started with the number 17.29000, you know, um, and then your number, other digits, which are not garbage digits, um, Rue will figure out that the shortest round trip is an integer 1729 times the decimal exponent 10 to the negative two. So it takes that integer, it converts it into characters, and it figures out the right place to put that decimal point, and it's done. And it actually turns out that the final step of taking that integer, 1,729, and decomposing it into characters, which any of us could write, um, is actually one of the slowest steps um, because the core algorithm is so fast. So we were able to get um, significant wins just by speeding up that step. Um, you have to do things like you know, modulo 100, modulo 10,000, special cases for 32-bit and 64-bit, um, and that actually turned to be, out to be one of the best places to optimize Roo because the core algorithm is so blazingly fast. Another interesting thing about this is that after reading the IEEE uh, representation and doing bitwise arithmetic, you know, bitwise shifts on it to extract the exponent in the mantissa, it never actually does any floating point operations at all. There's no floating point multiplication, addition, subtraction, division, none of that. It's all integer operations, shifts, uh, multiplications, things like that. Um, so your floating point unit will be completely cold. Um, when you use 
group, which is interesting. There's a related algorithm called Rube Printf. This was developed in response to a tweet as I was um, I finished implementing uh, shortest round trip decimal. I had to implement um, the precision form of two cares, and I was looking at that, and Rue itself was not directly applicable to precision. So I tweeted, and I said, wow, you know, uh, actually this was even earlier. It was when I was doing um, fixed shortest, which actually has to fall back to something, because if you print a very large integer, Rue is not directly applicable. Um, so you essentially need to do printf with zero precision. So I tweeted about this, and amazingly, Ulf Adams uh, read my tweet, and said, huh, I bet you I can do better than that. And he developed a second novel floating point algorithm doing better, to, better than anybody else in the world has ever done for printf. The history of algorithms for printf, as far as I can tell, is the original you know, implementations basically used big nums, and then Ulf came along in 2018 and generated root printf. As far as I can tell, there are no algorithmic adva advances in the middle. If anybody knows better, then please correct me. Um, unlike the Dragon 4 history, um, so he has done better than printf ever did, and that's actually why careconv is fast across the board, because it switches between Rue and Rue printf. Um, he's absolutely amazing. Thank you, uh, Ulf. So there's many performance tricks on top of Rue and Rue printf that careconv needs um, because of all the formats that it needs. Um, so as I mentioned, if you're doing shortest round trip for an integer, there needs to be a switch, um, which I implemented with a lookup table to determine uh, when Rue would actually chop off digits for a large integer, and then we switched to either long division or Rue printf. Um, general precision, which was the final, final boss to be implemented, um, uh, needs to do this thing, uh, if you read the C standard, trial formatting, where it needs to think about what would the scientific exponent be if I print it in, printed it in scientific form, and then make decisions based on it. Um, I looked into our CRT's code, which uses um, you know, trial formatting for general precision printf, and it just actually does the trial formatting. It prints into a temporary buffer and then looks at the exponent. And I was like, okay, I could run um, root printf twice, you know, worst case, um, but that would be, you know, slow even though root printf is fast. And what if the buffer isn't big enough? What if the user gives me a number that the scientific form would actually overflow the buffer, but the fixed form wouldn't? Um, and eventually I came to the realization I could use a lookup table to figure out what that exponent is without actually doing the trial formatting. Um, it's not a super amazing idea, but uh, it's certainly novel in our world in the UCRT. I'm wondering if any other implementations use this lookup table. Um, and then for the final formatting, I realized, hey, I can actually just use a stack buffer. I can just print out the number in fixed or scientific because I can bound exactly how big that buffer needs to be, and it's not that big. And then I can just zero trim in place. So I did not need to invasively modify root printf to do zero trimming, which I had been dreading. Um, and the end result is actually quite fast. And for hex precision, we've got some uh, fancy tricks. I can show you how that works if you want. Um, so I've been talking about how fast the performance is. What do the numbers look like? I promised order of magnitude. Does that actually happen? Um, so I reran my performance numbers um, on my desktop machine um, with uh, random floats and doubles. I just generated random bits. I threw away anything that was infinity or nan, and I ran the rest through careconv to compare its performance. Now, the performance uh, comparisons can be complicated because there's so many dimensions. You could swap out your compiler. Um, on our platform, we support CUNXX and Clang. Um, you could compile for different architectures. MSVC supports at least four. Um, we want to compare our CRT versus the STL, the float versus double type, and all these different formats, um, and also, you know, shortest and precision. So there's going to be a lot of numbers on the following tables. Um, I'm going to highlight the speed ups because those are the interesting ones. The raw timings, all of these are nanoseconds per floating point value. Um, some of them are large for the CRT and short for the STL. Um, and in some cases, I need to sort of compare not apples to oranges, but apples to pizza, because the STL's shortest format is not exactly rep uh, can't be exactly replicated in the CRT. So I compare CRT, round trip, you know, worst case precision. Um, close enough. And for fixed precision, I just say, okay, I'm going to compare something lossy. So let's look at from cares. Um, here, this is the table of timings, nanoseconds for the CRT and the STL um, for both x86, which is 32-bit, and x64. That makes a big difference. We'll see why. Um, and then the speed-up ratios. And the speed-up ratio is just old time divided by new time. So if you see a speed-up of two there, that means twice as fast. Speed-up of three means three times as fast. Um, here, from cares achieves eh, about you know a 37 to you know two point or 37 percent um, to 2.89x. Uh, perf improvement, depending on if you're using scientific notation or hex, 
and float versus double. And for x64, the speed ups are roughly similar. Um, scientific is, you know, maybe 19 to 28% faster, and hex is a lot faster. Um, some of this speed up in from cares, because they're using the same algorithm. I said that I started with the UCRT's from cares algorithm, which is powered by big nums. The speed up is really powered by not using locales, using a lookup table to parse digits, um, uh, not switching between file buffers and memory, because Kerkov is entirely in memory. Um, so in principle, much of this, well, some of this could be backported to the UCRT, and I've been talking to um, the UCRT team about um, bringing some of this improvement there. Um, for printing, the speedups are indeed massive because of this algorithm, algorithmic improvement from RU and RU printf. So for the precision form, this is RU printf, um, and this is where you can exactly compare the CRT to the STL. The speedups for x86 or x64, depending on the, no, uh, the notation being used, range from, you know, 4.5 around that neighborhood up to, you know, 12 or 13 times faster. This is enormous. So if, you're, if you have an application that is bottlenecked by floating point serialization, for example, you're writing out a database of floating point values to disk, or you're emitting JSON that needs to be sent over the network, and if it had lots of floating point values, previously you could have been CPU bottlenecked by this. Look at how long the worst case um, round trip for printing a double um, in general notation, 17 significant digits took. For x86 on my machine, it took 2,855 nanoseconds. That's entire microseconds, that's huge. Um, with uh, uh, CareCom, it takes only 206 nanoseconds. On x64, again, it's an order of magnitude, even though x64 um, is faster across the board. And this is the drop-in replacement for printf, the precision form. Um, so amazing performance improvements, even hex is faster. Um, so for shortest round trip, where, like I said, the comparison is kind of apples to pizza, um, the speed up um, is not quite a fair comparison, but it's still enormous. Um, this shows you the true power of Roo. Um, on this particular machine, um, it can convert, uh, let me just pick a number out here, um, scientific, double scientific. We can uh, print a double in scientific form in round trip notation in 54 nanoseconds. That's way better than 610 on x64. I was counting every nanosecond as we were optimizing uh, Roo and Roo printf. And when it, when it went down by one, I was like, yes, we just shaved off a nanosecond, because that's like, you know, 2%. Or, you know, if we shaved off five nanoseconds, that's like 10%. It's amazing. Um, and I'm still um, reporting issues to the compiler team about, hey, they could shave off a few more nanoseconds and buy another, you know, you know 2x, 3x on top of the uh, CRT here. So overall, you know, that was a lot of numbers on those tables. CareConf is just incredibly fast. And thanks to both RU and RU printf, um, it is sort of fast across the board, unless you ask for fixed notation, uh, which emits potentially a lot of digits, the performance is nearly uniform. And I did not think that that was gonna be the case at first. At first I thought, oh, printing shortest might be fast, but precision would be slow, and it didn't end up being that way. Um, this is also an interesting case where um, the table showed that x64 is often twice as fast as x86. That was true for um, classic printf, and it's true for careconf, and this is because x64 can do wider multiplies. People often say, oh, you know, 64-bit might actually be slower because the pointers are larger, the size t's are larger, and you have the same amount of cache, and that might be true for other programs, but CareConf, all it cares about in this implementation is multiplying large numbers um, and doing other, you know, large, wide math, and x64 is great at that. So if you really care, use 64-bit for your code. So although CareConf is quite fast, we must go faster. Um, now, hilariously, um, integer CareConf stands to be improved. We wrote a correct implementation. That is not slow, but it is naive, um, and it should be improved in the future. Uh, we're looking into that. Um, for floating point, um, I filed bugs against both uh, MSVC's compiler, uh, backend, and LVM, um, and they've been improving their code gen, which is amazing. Um, uh, so there's some compiler improvements there. RU is just sort of unlike anything that the, the compilers have been tuned for before. Um, and also another um, area of improvement is SIMD. Um, using vectorized instructions could be a source of great improvement because often we want to multiply a whole bunch of numbers like four or five, um, I think, yeah, three or four maybe, um, at the same time. That is SIMD. Even for the final step of taking an integer like 1729 and decomposing it into uh, characters, we often need to do things like a modulo to, you know, by mod 100 to two integers simultaneously. That's SIMD. Um, I am not a SIMD expert. In fact, I just basically wrote a SIMD Hello World as a prototype. Um, and I was able to achieve what looked like a 10% performance improvement 
um, just by tuning the final digit generation. I have no idea where else things could be vectorized. Now, we would need runtime switching um, because on our implementation, we're not sure what processor we're gonna be running on, and we need to handle processors that only have um, SSC2 on x64 or IA32 on x86. But if the processor is capable of SSC2 or AVX or all those things, um, we might be able to emit even faster code. Um, there's possible algorithmic improvements. I've linked there to an issue on the Ru repo. Um, and perhaps we could get a new algorithm for from cares. Um, currently, I know, no, I know of no way to avoid big nums for from cares. But the existence of fast algorithms for two cares seems to indicate that maybe we could do the base conversion the from cares needs to do using purely, you know, wide-ish integers? I don't know how. Um, but I think the area has been underexplored. So if you want more info, um, these slides have a whole table of links. Um, you can either take a photo of this or the slides will be available. Um, like I said, our STL is open source. If you want to read our implementation, you can right now. Um, there's our repo on GitHub, and I've included the paths to CareConv um, and its helper internal headers. Um, it's split across a few um, to separate out the parts that are rue based and the parts that aren't, and the huge tables just for speed of editing in the IDE. Um, there's a link to um, Ulf Adam's Ru repo, um, which is upstream, um, that both Ru and RuePrintf are built out of, um, and a link to his talk on YouTube. Um, the talk is great, please watch it. Um, there's a link to the CS Plus working paper where Caricom specification is. You can go uh, read the section there. I've, linked, I've put the stable name there. And you can see how three pages of standard ease, it's actually a little bit less, expanded into such a journey of implementation. Um, and also I've uh, linked a draft of the C11 standard there um, for the standard ease for fprintf, which is necessary if you want to understand how CareConf works. Um, the C standard sort of cheated in some sense by deferring to the C, uh, uh, sorry, the CS plus standard cheated by deferring to the C standard for the specification of fprintf. Um, I've got a link there to Rick Regan's blog, Exploring Binary which has a whole bunch of articles about binary to decimal conversions, understanding floating point. This was enormously helpful um, to my colleague James McNellis when he overhauled the UCRT's floating point um, routines um, back in the 2015 era. And it was enormously helpful to me as I was learning um, how all of these um, you know, floating point math issues work. Uh, no, the notions of you know, decimal shortest round trip or binary decimal binary and so forth. And finally, uh, but not least, links to Wikipedia's article on articles on single precision and double precision uh, floating point formats. I like to joke that if you're working on a nuclear reactor, maybe as a nuclear engineer, you shouldn't be looking it up on Wikipedia. Um, but sometimes you're just forced to. So I was forced to implement Kirchhoff, and I had a very limited understanding of floating point. I learned a lot from Wikipedia's articles, and I think they're worth reading. They have nice diagrams, um, nice explanations of corner cases. Um, so if you have any questions, um, we've got about seven minutes. Um, please come up to the microphone. Thank you for your work. Um, do you have any plans to do this for wide character? So right now, um, the standard does not specify any wide character form. Um, so, from that perspective, my answer is no plans. Um, as a general rule, we don't implement extensions beyond the standard unless they make a whole lot of sense and aren't incredible amounts of work. Now, interestingly for wide characters, I can actually tell you it wouldn't be incredible amounts of work because the step to digest the character is actually just the very beginning of CareConf. I could actually pretty easily template that. Um, and once I get the actual numeric value, you know, zero through nine, I'm done. Um, so if the committee standardized standardizes a wide character form, either WKRT or KR16, KR32, we'll happily implement it. Uh, but until then, we have no plans. Fortunately, because the code is open source, you can take it and just template it um, following our license. Thank you. I was wondering, uh, I've actually implemented Dragon, the, the, the first algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if one of the optimizations was um, related to the fact that you can take 10 to the end as a 2 to the end, 5 to the end, so you can just do all the shifts in the 2 to the end and only have to worry about 5 to the end. Yes, that in fact is a critical step as I understand it in Roo. Um, it's all based around those powers of 5. Okay. I guess I'm just curious why the committee decided to write the standard that way, knowing that at the time there was no good algorithm. Well, it was going to be very, very difficult to implement this efficiently. And well, no, nobody... 
Oh yeah, nobody really appreciated the difficulty of it, I think. Um, and also, it was just sort of vaguely understood by the committee that eh, algorithms are kind of fast. At the time, the best known algorithm was Grisu 3, which can be quite fast. Um, yeah, you need the fallback algorithm, but if you have that, Grisu 3 ends up achieving pretty decent speed. Um, so it was thought that it was a solved problem, and it wasn't until we really started looking into it and Rue came along that we said, wait, we can actually do way better. Thank you for the awesome talk. Uh, I basically have two questions. One of them is super short. Uh, does the SDL distribution that open, recently open source come with a test suite as well? It does not yet come with a test suite, but it will. We are working, as soon as we get back from CPCon, on bringing our tests in CI online. We intend to fully open source our primary test suites, uh, DevCRT and TR1, and also how we've harnessed LibCS Plus's test suite, which we refer to as LibCXX. That is fantastic. And the second question is, Kind of from your understanding of the Rue algorithm, mm -hmm. can it be easily extended to say quad precision floats, or is it so magical that it's hard? It can be extended to quad precision. In fact, Ulf has an implementation, if you look in his repo, um, in the file generic underscore 128.c, um, that is a sort of proof of concept, as I understand it, for quad precision. Um, the necessary tables, I believe, are larger. Um, and the code has not been as extensively optimized as for 32 and 64 bit in particular. I have not looked at it at all, really. Um, I said, oh, it's nice that those files are there. I'm glad I don't have to deal with it. Um, but yes, in principle, um, it can be quite efficient. In fact, um, due to how things scale with the size, I expect the wins will be even greater for 128 bit. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. I was wondering, by the benchmark tools, were you restricted to just profiling with Visual Studio, or were you able to use Intel VTune, and when the benchmark do you release with your test suite? Ah, um, I did not use Intel VTune. Uh, my colleague, uh, Billy O'Neill, has used it extensively. I just don't have any experience with it myself. Um, we absolutely should be looking at CareCal with VTune. There, I was simply looping over um, like a million or two million random doubles like three times and using steady clock to you know, get an overall um, you know, performance view of it. Um, but we actually do, absolutely should look at it um, with finer grain tools like VTune, um, with things like Google Benchmark. Um, I do have my test case, and in fact, I should release that. Um, I will make a to-do. Um, right now, we don't have, we have a, a sort of a VC Libs Benchmarks um, repo um, that we were accumulating some performance test cases in. Um, and it was sort of separate from the rest of our repo because it was built with CMake. Well, now our SDL is built with CMake. Um, so there's a case to be made for just having the benchmark side by side with the tests. Uh, I will release, uh, I'll, in the speaker files, I'll attach my um, CPP file that I use to generate these numbers for you. Um, hi, uh, first of all, great talk. Um, I was wondering, uh, you mentioned a lot the fact that the tables really improve performance with the real algorithm. Yes. Um, I was wondering if uh, the benchmarks that you uh, run uh, consider the fact that flows coming in and out of cache might affect performance. Right, this does not, uh, incorporate any cache effects, it's assuming that just in a hot loop you're converting double after double after double and checking only for um, success um, and not that, oh, some other code came in and evicted the tables from cache. Um, so yes, if the tables are being evicted, it will be somewhat slower. Um, they do fit into L2 cache in general, which is good. Um, the tables for uh, Rue, uh, the size of L1 caches may be uh, they should be good for Rue, actually. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I believe the tables, even for double, are only 11 kilobytes for Rue's shortest. It's for precision, uh, the Rue printf form, that the tables are larger. That's where like 100 kilobytes of tables come from. Um, so depending on the notation you're using, um, depending on how large your caches are, you may see some sort of cache effect. Um, there are um, options in upstream Rue, uh, which uh, Ulf Adams called Rue optimized size, that uses smaller tables, very small, um, but at the cost of runtime performance. I chose not to activate that option, but that could be something that could be valuable for you. Um, if it matters to enough people, we could even consider adding such modes to our standard library um, because it wouldn't pose ABI compatibility concerns. Uh, it would be a, some, eh, a moderate amount of work to do so. So we're really interested in feedback from the community. Um, I released the tables in the large form that they have right now because I felt, oh, speed is gonna be good. They're you know, read-only. Um, but if people say, wow, these tables are just too big, they're being evicted from cash, we can definitely rethink the tuning there. Thank you. Thanks. So when you uh, look at these slides, I got 40 seconds left. Um, at the back here, there are some bonus slides for you to read. I'm just gonna flip quickly through them. A uh, little bit about large integers, um, a gotcha about rounding twice to lose precision. Don't go from string to double to float, that's bad. 
um, a little uh, introduction to hexadecimal floating point, um, how it's sort of human readable IEEE if you learn how to do that. Um, and finally, uh, perf numbers for Clang LVM. Um, the perf right now is better with Clang LVM, so you can totally use that with our STL. Um, and then finally, some numbers um, comparing uh, the STL against glibc on Ubuntu, um, just to rule out the Windows UCRT being unusually slow. It's not. Um, this is a real al algorithmic improvement for Ruprino. So check that out on the slides when they're available. Thank you. <laughs>